Good morning. It's time for the CareCast, brought to you by the Knowledge and Evaluation Research Unit at Mayo Clinic. I am your host, Victor Montori, and today we have a treat. Ian Hargraves, Dr. Ian Hargraves, originally from New Zealand, is with us today. Uh, he's one of the most consequential minds in healthcare today, in my opinion. He is bringing a completely different way of thinking about care uh, and some aspects related to it in relation to shared decision-making and regenerative care. And I'm hoping that today we will touch on all those uh, issues. Ian has a master's degree and a PhD in design from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh uh, here in America. And um, he's been working at the uh, care unit, understanding the ways in which shared decision-making varies and how it can be supported uh, across a range of patient problems and situation. And more recently has been working also on a new way of thinking about regenerative care, as I mentioned before. Ian, it's, a, uh, it's absolutely wonderful to have you today in the CareCast, welcome. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to talk with you, and, and um, thank you for everybody for joining. Excellent. Um, as with all these series, uh, Ian, the first question that I would like us to explore is, how does one become Ian Hargraves? Um, that's a tough question with no simple answer. Um, but let me take a crack at it. As you mentioned, Victor, um, I'm from New Zealand. Uh, I was, I lived and grew up in a, in a relatively small town of 30,000 people, an agricultural port um, by the name of Timaru, um, quite remote from the rest of the world in many ways. In fact, um, you and I essentially grew up as neighbors and that you were just on the other side. If I looked out of my kitchen window across the Pacific Ocean, um, <laughs> I could practically see your house just over there um, in South America. Uh, um, I'm one of five children. Um, I um, had the good fortune after uh, finishing high school to apprentice as a pipe organ builder. Um, my father is a pipe organ builder and I joined um, the company in which he was a, a director and, and apprentice there. Um, I worked um, in that company for about, I don't know, seven or eight years in that period with, with various um, intervals um, beyond that. Uh, that, that was a um, that was a wonderful experience um, and in many ways made or contributed a lot to who I, who I am and, and how in, I think in what in what ways I mean I can't I can I can it's not obvious I think the connection between uh, pipe organ is it was it building or is it fixing and and what you do now so so it's a range of things so it it was pipe organ building restoration repair tuning maintenance design um, rebuilding um, many number of things and, and what's the connection with with what you do today i it uh, um, i mean it, uh, it's 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 beautiful work but uh, is there an obvious connection uh well, I, I think, I think um, like many of us, uh, our paths are windy and take us through um, territory that couldn't necessarily have been predicted going forward. But I think themes and connections can be traced backwards retrospectively mm -hmm. um, that, that, that connect. And, and, and I think I, I tell my own stories in that way. Um, I think the nature of the instrument, the pipe organ, um, which, which for those who aren't familiar is a large um, musical instrument commonly found in churches, certainly in, in, um, in Europe um, and, and uh, much of it. It has a longevity, which is human in scale um, or longer. What do you mean by that? 
So when we're creating um, instruments, we expect that instrument will be um, living alive for at least the length of our lifetimes and in many cases much longer. Um, each instrument is an individual, um, so it's then not mass produced. Um, each one is designed for its space, um, for, its, for its community and the like, so it has that individuality um, in common with, with patient care. Um, there are other points of connection, I guess, it's often to, uh, described in physiological terms as having lungs and breathing and having touch and essentially ligaments and voice. Um, so, so there's definitely connections. In and and your, your job as an apprentice uh, interacting with this, uh, I presume, uh, gave you an opportunity to um, participate in the in, in in this shaping of the uh, pipe organ to its future uh, location or future situation and to help it um, uh, express its voice yes no exactly um, exactly that the work of, of making it an individual um, bringing its potential forward, um, helping it contribute to the, to the congregation or, or the people that we're serving. Yeah, there's there's an interesting connection there with, uh, with care, which is, of course, the focus of your work now, in that um, uh, one could imagine patient and clinician uh, uh, working together to help um, uh, fashion uh, a, a a, a, a patient's experience or a patient's life in which health and, and, and healthcare uh, play a, um, a supporting role in, in human flourishing. I suspect that's, that's a potential connection there. Yeah, no, no, exactly. Um, I think some of the work, particularly in the regenerative space and even the, in the sheer decisions making space is really focused on um, how we build and create in people's lives. So how do we make something that we can call care or a contribution of medicine that, that lives in the lives of people, um, uh, helps reshape, rebuild, um, maintain, uh, restore, all these, all these words which were part of the practice of organ building also are very much themes um, in medicine and in care. So you end up with a master's and a, and a doctorate in design. Um, uh, were you able to bring those, um, uh, those themes of, of designing into, into, into care? Because the first time you and I met, you were going through that uh, program of study and we were at Mayo developing the first um, design, you know, in-house design capability to focus on, on the experience of, of healthcare and healthcare service. And, and you came to visit um, and you were doing that work at the time. Um, so that was that the, the doctorate work, was it to, to bring those two strands together, care and design? Yeah, so that, that was the focus of my, my dissertation is what is the relationship between these um, two apparently very different disciplines and in reality very different disciplines, but which had the similar sort of thematic connections that, that I mentioned previously in relationship to pipe organ building. Um, looking at the idea of human-centered design, which was really the approach to design that, that I um, was educated within, the idea that the purpose of designing is to support um, the lives of the people that we're creating for. Um, it's less to express um, the vision or the will of the designer, although that, that's an important part too, but really asking questions around um, what it is to be human, what it is to make and create within a human world in ways that serve serve people and honor their dignity. That that's a very different, uh, these different sounding explanation of what most people will think about design. I mean, the way design has been popularized 
It is through the design of um, beautiful objects and useful objects uh, with which we interact on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and one could argue not all of those objects are uh, designed with the purpose of, uh, of making our lives more dignified or, or, or better, uh, but sometimes as an expression of a brand or as an expression of, as you said, the, the artistic creativity and vision of the designer. Um, so, so is this is this a different way of thinking of design than what has been popularized uh, in the last I don't know 20, 30 years? Yeah, I guess so. Um, I think I think the theme has been there if you go back in history as well that that there's a lot of um, creating the world around us in ways that um, help people be who they are give expression to that and the like. But certainly in the in the 20th century when the word design really emerged in a, in a professional context, a lot of the a lot of the associations are with um, the beautiful object um, and the like. Mm. The um, uh... I think we've talked in the past about a, um, a that oftentimes when we interact with um, design and with designers, the nature of the problem itself gets often uh, um, uh, taken to uh, modified to meet the um, the abilities and the skill set and the uh, discipline of design itself, so that when uh, designers may start with a problem and come back with a solution that it's a great, great design, but it may not actually solve the initial problem that was formulated. And um, you've, you've, you've had a bit of a critical, uh, a critical sense of, of that, uh, of that way of designing, right? Yeah. And, and I think it's an issue in, in all disciplines that um, what we end up doing is very much matched to our skill set, whether our skill set is the right um, tool for the job or not. Um, and certainly it's no less true in design that design consultancies um, often often have a way of doing things or the kind of thing that they make and 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 there's a certain amount of repetition in that work mm. uh, and th there's good reasons for that it sort of connects to the theme of efficiency that that you, you've talked about before and there are benefits to efficiency but it can run away and, and leave um Go off the rails, I guess. Yeah. So let's, let, so 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 it's interesting because it it, it forces the the eye. It, it turns the gaze from the what is designed, the object or the service or the experience, to what happens to people and 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 uh, in relation to that design. How is that design affecting people? And so that that, that leads me to 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 ask you, you know, what's been the primary value driving your 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 exploration, your career, you know, from the agricultural port to the Mayo Clinic? Yeah, so um, this question's been on my mind because I knew you were going to ask it, um, and and I don't know that I exactly have a simple answer. I think the answer that I have. Um, sound simplistic which which would be the idea that at some fundamental level people matter and we live in a world in which people matter and um, who we are what we create how we relate to other people are expressions mm -hmm. expressions of that and all the other values that we might name um, flow out of that simple idea if people didn't matter there would be no no justice no generosity no patient centeredness no integrity all of those concepts or values simply don't work unless um, unless at some fundamental level people matter um, and so linking it back to the work I think that we do in the care unit and design, um, again, I had the good fortune to spend some time with people who have a connection to philosophy. And so I turn a small amount of my attention in that way. Um, there's a guy named Richard McKeon, who was a mid 20th century philosopher at the University of Chicago, um, heavily, heavily important in the ideas of pluralism 
Um, and and he, ha he had an observation or a claim, I guess, that he said that um, truth, something like uh, truth may be one, but it ha it's not given or it doesn't have one expression. Um, so if we relate it back to the simple idea that people matter, if that's a truth, or what is, is a unity, then it has no single expression no single expression and so medicine explores it, design explores it, pipe organ building explores it, um, the way we live with our family explores it, expression expresses it and the like. So I don't know that I have any one single um, value principle that I pursue. Um, Similarly, I was just looking this morning and, and the, I, I recalled um, a phrase from the Irish poet Shaney, um, Haney, Sh Seamus Haney, um, and he closes the address that he gave when he was accepting his Nobel Prize with the idea that we are hunters and gatherers of values. And I think that's that's a very nice way of thinking about um, what it is to interact with patients, um, to learn from them, to grow with them. Um, as designers, the idea that um, the values aren't out there and we pursue them, but we gather them and give them expression, um, both as patients and as that's a, It's clinicians. a fascinating view of that, isn't it? Because um, um, you know, as, as you know, we are very, quite interested in this notion of um, seeing patients in, in high definition. But uh, uh, it now occurs to me that an expression of that is almost to uncover their truth, at least the expression of their truth, uh, or the expressions of their truth, um, as we interact with them, and in the process, perhaps uh, gather uh, values for our, a better living. And so that puts uh, people who care as learners mm -hmm. um, uh, and learning from those who are uh, receiving that care. And I presume it's a uh, bi-directional process. It, it, that's a, it's a lovely idea that connects with the, I think, principle of generosity that our unit has in terms of offering and, and picking up you know, from, from others. And in, in that way, I mean, the unit has talked about patient centeredness and integrity and generosity. Any of those three values that the unit has resonate stronger with you? Um, so I think almost everybody in the series has identified generosity and that's the one that would, that would um, leap to my mind as well. I, I think it's, perhaps closest to how we relate to people um, in terms of our spirit, our, our intellectual curiosity and the like. Um, I think a lot of possibility opens up with, from generous views of who people are, what the world can be and, and where, we, when we, where we direct our effort. Thank yeah. You. Well, you've been particularly generous. I, you know, I've I've been reflecting on, on my own language um, and how uh, I speak today about uh, care, which of course is uh, my fundamental activity as a physician. Um, that I, I find myself drawing uh, more uh, of the language that I use to describe that um, that daily activity from my interactions with you than I I believe I am drawing from the traditions of medicine itself. Um, uh, I'm talking about mostly the biomedical uh, model. Um, and, uh, and I think that's been an expression of your generosity. You and I uh, joke occasionally that, uh, well, it's, a, it's a, uh, maybe I'm joking, maybe you're not joking, but I, I, often, um, I often laugh or smile um, uh, when I, I point out that um, I give a lot of talks and uh, most of the time what I'm saying to audiences is what you've said to me. And, um, um, uh, and it's a, I, I've always been very proud of representing your thought um, it, to the audiences that, uh, that invite me and, um, and uh, I presume uh, I've been uh, quite uh, uh, liberal with um, owning um, your language and the ideas that you've offered me. So, you know, that is, uh, 
uh, I'm very, very, very grateful uh, for your generosity in, uh, in both helping me see different ways of thinking about care, but also giving me language to express um, those new ways of thinking and, and, and doing um, that are now essential to my understanding of, of, of the world of care. Um, so you've obviously embodied the generosity principle in, in ways that are uh, quite extraordinary. So I, I have to thank you for that. Well, thank you. Um, you're always very generous with your praise and your comments along these lines. And, and I feel myself left, left blushing and without much to say in response. But <laughs> well, I, I presume you. You know, most of the people uh, uh, interacting with this caricast will do it through the podcast. So, you know, we'll have to describe the blushing to those people who cannot see the video. Uh, but no, it's a, it's a lovely thing. So the um, one of the things that you've told me is is about um, the way in which people um, uh, live their lives and how uh, how that living of your life, that how the life itself and the living of that life um, can be affected by disease, can be limited in some way, and uh, and you find it important to not only um, you know, make something to make that to make that better, but to to put it to the in the service of people living their life uh, and so forth. Um, and and uh, it, I presume, it has to do again going back to the pipe organ. Is that uh, you know, the, a pipe organ could be a beautiful instrument with an incredible and more and very personal voice. Um, you know, drawing from what you said at the beginning, um, but it only comes to serve its purpose. When it's uh, when it's able to sing um, in a service, you know, in a in a in a church service or in a funeral or in a wedding, uh, in the gathering of people, um, uh, help help us understand how is it that uh, helping people uh, serve their purpose is is an important part of care. Um, so there's several ways to pick it up, maybe. Uh, maybe I'll go back to the Bible and you know, again as an analogy and, and uh, explore those connections. Uh, so, um, as I suggested, the pipe organ is a very complicated instrument. Um, there's a lot going on mechanically, pneumatically, sometimes electrically. Um, with, within that instrument, it fills a large volume and there's a lot of connections made. And so there's a sort of me mechanical um, care or carefulness that goes into to getting that part working and, and I think um, that technical side is, is very prevalent in medical education and medical um, um, expertise today but um, that view of the pipe organ were important you can make something technically perfect but without somebody to play it it sits there um, gathering dust and and so another another important part of of the pipe organ is the ability to give expression to the people who are playing it um, draw out their virtuosity um, uh, both as players and as audiences um, receivers or partakers in, in that artistry and I, and I think there's a lot of virtuosity and in, in caring relationships as well the way that we bring forth our spirit both as patients and as clinicians so um, virtuosity in patients. what's that virtuosity in patients yeah no I think so so I think um and it speaks to the relationships that people form, um, how, they, how they find who they are in relationship with um, the people in the room, whether they're patients or clinicians, a lot of creativity in that work, um, a lot of finding language to communicate um, and the like. So, so I think that's an important theme as well. Mm. But similarly, um, uh, at the risk of beating this analogy to death. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll play a requiem for it at the end of it, yes. <laughs> um, uh, again, uh, the, the 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 machine, the artistry is is in service of something. So that's why uh, these instruments live in churches. They serve. Um, 
in the grief of people and in weddings and the joy of people. And I mean, that's a bit of a Freudian slip too. Um, <laughs> the grief of people in, in funerals and, um, and the joy of people in weddings, the day-to-day -day, um, celebrations that are part of worship. So it, it has a role in which service is a very important part. Yeah. Uh, which is really at the core of medicine too that that you can have um you can have great technical expertise have a wonderful manner patient-centered manner but unless it actually serves and helps people in your experience it's all well, one of the well. one of the innovations that you've um that you have um uh put forward um has been this idea of connecting an activity or, or a way of caring, like shared decision-making with its, with the purpose of, that is a, a purpose of care. Um, and I, it seems to me that this, what you just said about uh, what you do, you know, what pipe organs uh, uh, do when they are used uh, and uh, uh, seems that there's a thread there. You, you want to tell us a bit more about this idea of, of thinking about how do we work with patients to co-produce or co-create plans of care. Why did you see the need to, to go from, well, this is just one way in which we do it to think about, no, there might be multiple ways because we might be pursuing different purposes. How, how, how do you end up there? How, how, do you, how do you get there? Sure. Um, so, so I think the, the notion of human-centered design comes in uh, there as well. Um, so that approach has a has a large concern for the hum humanity of people, the the individuality of who people are, or or the cohesiveness of communities and relationships. But it also um, links that to some sort of need, some sort of purpose in the world, um, and aims to create things that that serve people. Um, and so I think in the history of shared decision making, there's been a number of motivations behind it. Um, a large part of it is driven out of the need for patients, the deep ethical need for patients to be involved in their care, to, mm -hmm. to have the ability to express um, their desires, their preferences and wishes. Um, the value of autonomy is, is highly important there. Um, and and I, I think the, the field, um, not that it's, it's um, homogeneous, has largely focused on those issues, which are, as I say, very important. But at the end of the day, um, we make decisions in healthcare in order to help people. Uh, not to involve people, um, and and that we make decisions in response to suffering or problems in the experience of people, and um, there's a range of different problems that that folks have or or look to help for from healthcare with regard to, um, and. And the work and purposeful shared decision making, which is really this line of thinking, says, um, okay, the reason we make decisions depends on problems, but also the way that we go about making decisions would also depend on problems. So one of the examples we've used is, is that if um, somebody is sitting down with their primary care doctor, um, and they've come to the point of view or that the place where they recognize that maybe starting an antidepressant would be a good way to proceed. Um, and so there's clearly a problem there. The point of discussion is, okay, if we're going to use an antidepressant, well, which one? Um, so then we might turn to, um, well, what are the, what is the, characteristics of the drugs, their efficacy, their side effects, um, how it intersects with your preferences and sort of use a weighing approach to come to a decision. But if, if in a similar, similar um, if you look to depression again, and the issue isn't really so much which antidepressant to use, but whether the person wants to be the sort of person who is medicated, 
uh, or takes medications or sees medications as a sign of weakness, weighing the pros and cons of the different drugs isn't really going to address that problem. The person has some sort of internal conflict um, and, and some sort of um, way of resolving that conflict is needed uh, to address that. And so we might use a strategy of negotiation or argument, um, conflict resolution to come to a decision there and, and the method of weighing pros and cons and preferences may have a much more limited role. Yeah. So, so there's the connection between the problem you're trying to address and how you address it um, mm -hmm. and, and, and trying to get a fit between the intervention and the problem uh, seems uh, commonsensical, but somehow missed, um, uh, again, up to, to a great extent, up to your contribution uh, on purposeful SDM. So uh, uh, it's, it's an important contribution. Um, the as we think about the collaborations that have shaped you, because you know, there's we've talked about some experiences that have shaped you, but I'm interested in knowing what what, what what's been your best collaboration. Um, uh, what, what what collaborations have shaped uh, who you are and how what you do and how you do things today. I don't know if there's a best one because. <laughs> no, no, we are just number one. We're just, no, no, but, but, but you know, this, you know, which ones are inspiring, or which ones are, or maybe what what has been their meaning uh, to the work that you've done. Um. So, so I, the ones that I get most energized about is the ones are the ones where there's clearly a problem in people's lives and the people who are on, who are part of the team um, are committed and driven by that problem. Um, so it comes to mind the, the collaboration uh, with Bjorg Thorsten's daughter around um, chronic kidney disease care for, for older folks um, who are approaching dialysis who many times find themselves waking up in the hospital on dialysis machines without any um, great preparation given for that, dramatic changes in their lives, um, unclear benefits in terms of longevity of that mm -hmm. process. And so it's clearly a, a problem there. Other collaborations, I think, uh, energizing for me are the ones we're pursuing around regenerative medicine currently mm -hmm. where um, it's a different way of looking at medicine. Um, regenerative medicine is, is commonly thought of as in terms of stem cells and, and very high tech. Yeah, um, very exciting area. Mm -hmm. What's that? Very exciting area, you know, with a lot of technology and uh, biological developments. Yes, no, it is. And, and um, and, and there's a certain glamour um, to that work, which, which uh, I think is warranted and, and um, very promising. Uh, but we are looking at developing a regenerative um, clinic within endocrinology for folks who have been living with diabetes for, for a long while. Um, clearly, clearly lots of problems there in people's lives. Um, but in doing so, we're um, almost reconceptualizing or refocusing what the idea of regeneration might mean in terms of care, in terms of medicine, and, uh, and saying that fundamentally uh, one of the distinctions of a regenerative approach isn't so much that it uses stem cells or cellular products, um, but that it's a medicine that focuses on building, on creating mm. things. As opposed to, to fighting disease. Exactly. So, so there's a lot of talk of fighting um, in medicine. In some ways, it dominates our language. We talk about the battle against cancer, fighting obesity, um, mitigating behaviors, uh, fighting infections and the like. So, so it's a dominant um, orientation. The regenerative approach that we're talking about is saying that um, regeneration has genesis, uh, generation at its core. Um, and so it's a creative activity typically thought of in terms of the building or creation or recreation of tissues or function. 
Um, but ex we're ex looking at extending that idea of a medicine building by asking the question, well, what does it, what's involved in creating in the lives of people mm -hmm. uh, along with patients? How do we build in that context, shifting, shifting the object of care away from um, disease or to uh, the lives of people that fundamentally medicine is contributing to the building of how people who people are and how they live their lives so, in, a, uh, in a very yeah. modest contribution yeah so rehabilitation for instance uh, for a missing limb or for a missing function comes to mind as a as an example of this yeah, no, very much so. It, it's it's involved in creating new capacities um, or restoring capacities. Um, often involves rebuilding the environment in which people live. Um, sometimes involves recreating relationships or points of view or senses of self and the like. Yeah, people have been doing this during COVID in, in a big way, right? I mean, they found themselves away from co-workers, uh, working from home, uh, oftentimes uh, refocused on the education of their children, as uh, children have to learn uh, virtually and they're at home. And they had to reinvent, to some extent, a life uh, under the conditions imposed by this massive effort of, uh, of uh, solidarity in making sure that we can all keep each other safe and so forth. And, um, and so what I think what you're saying is that in addition, you know, that would be an example of how under a change in our context, we've had to re-imagine uh, how do we make, a, how do we flourish uh, with, uh, within those constraints. And in disease introduces a different set of constraints, but the challenge is similar. How do we build health from the constraints imposed by disease? Is that, that, do I get that right? Yeah, no, I think that's a great analogy and points to the sort of everyday of this work of, of um, adapting, recreating our lives in, in response to the environment and what we learn and, and who we relate to as, as, we, as we live. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's amazing that you can bring that into, into care, into medicine. How, how do you identify these areas? You know, how did you, how, how did, what attracts you to these areas of, oh, you know, Sure, decision making too narrow. Let's expand the, the scope to make sure it matches the problems. Oh, regenerative medicine. Wow, you know, it seems like it has a, this incredible potential, but we're only thinking of it biologically. How, how, how do you get to identify these opportunities uh, for redesigning healthcare? Um, so, so, again, I, I think I would take it back to design. Um, design is an art of invention of, of, of not only making stuff that we know how to make, but also creating things that didn't seem possible at some point. And, and so part of the education that I was lucky enough to receive in design was focused on um, not incremental change, but, but how you look at things in, from a completely different um, uh, point of view is not really strong enough, but uh, something along those lines that opens up new possibilities. Um, and, and so I think, um, I think that way of working that says, um, what would the world be if we looked at it this way? Um, and what would problems would we see? Um, mm -hmm. And perhaps more importantly, what would it be possible to do if we approached medicine not from a um, point of view of fighting, but a point of view of helping people build in the, who they are and how they live? So it's, it's a bit of a full circle, isn't it, Ian, that uh, you start with thinking about how we redesign medicine and then you are at the point thinking about how can medicine redesign? Yeah, um, uh, and importantly with patients, I, I think the contribution of medicine is a pretty humble uh, part of people's lives. And, and I think we need to be careful when we think in terms of redesigning people's lives, it, it's a little grandiose, um, but, 
but I think uh, themes that have been part of a unit for a, for a while point in this direction. Um, so the work around minimally disruptive medicine um, recognizes that when, when medicine, medicine asks folks to do things, it changes how they live. Mm. Um, and so has either has often inadvertently redesigned their, <laughs> their lives, whether they wanted to or not. And so mm. how do we do it in a thought? way is is an important issue hmm. the um um on that note uh the, this series is called care you know it's it, it's part of the, our work on care that fits and uh um what what does that mean to you yeah so i i think it means several things and, and maybe this is an example of, of what happens when you look at the idea of fit from these different perspectives or, or what it could mean rather than what does it mean. Um, so, so I think there's various ways of picking up the concepts, each of which point to different interventions and completely different lines of research um, and have the possibility of overlapping as well. So one idea of fit is simply um, something along the lines of are we trying to put a square peg in a round hole? Does it actually fit um, mechanically or um, or in the processes of a person's lives in their context. Um, another idea of fit, which um, Marlene Kuhneman is exploring, I think quite extensively is the idea of fitting. So we have pipe fitters, um, we go in to have our clothes fit sometimes, um, and there's people involved in doing that fitting work. So what are the interactions between patients and clinicians in which they engage in, in this fitting work. Um, and so there's a whole line of research there um, and possible things that we could do to make the world better. Um, another, another way of picking it up is with the idea of fit for purpose. Mm. So is what we're doing actually fit to the purposes it serves? Um, what role does it have in people's lives? How does it serve their problems, who they are, how they live, and, make, and how does it contribute, I think is probably a dominant theme there, is, is what actually is the contribution of care or health care in a person's life? Um, so is it fit for a purpose? And another way of picking it up is... Um, sort of through the analogy of is it fit for human consumption so uh, does it is it uh, is it matched to the dignity of people of their who they are at a deep existential level um, is it respectful uh, all these things is it fit for human consumption yeah, it, uh, it, it, one could see that the, this process or uh, achieve, achievement of it, um, uh, you're, you've connected it back to this fundamental primary value that animates you, which is the idea of, of, of people matter and how you, uh, uh, how you help uh, people in that process of, of realizing their, their full potential. Um, uh, this comes in contrast with the way many of the objects that are designed in our lives seem to be uh, designed to take advantage of the limitations that people have. For instance, our, the challenges that we all face with our attention and how our smart devices um, um, capitalize, uh, and I think that's exactly the word, but capitalize on our cha the challenges that we have with our attention to take advantage of that, uh, to sell us a product or to modify our behavior, right? And that that doesn't seem to uh, follow the same logic that you are following, which is which speaks about human flourishing um, as, as, as the purpose of both care and I presume of careful design. Um, and and I, at this point, I feel like uh, most people that are listening to us might, might uh, uh, feel quite envious that I get a chance to work with you, Ian, where a, a, a potential single dimensional aspect of a problem when you uh, when you approach it and you touch it, you have so many different ways of looking at it that open up the opportunities for both creativity and full potential. Uh, and one of the questions that we're getting from our audience today has to do with that. 
is 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 this something that you know healthcare professionals uh, uh, gain access to by interacting with people like you, or should this be baked into the way we uh, we train health professionals? Should should health professionals be trained in the kind of um, uh, careful design uh, that you espouse? Uh, should that be part of medical training? Um. So I think it's part of medicine. And so, <laughs> so probably people who are le learning that art and science should have some exposure or develop capacities with it. I think the idea of medicine being fit for human consumption, medical ethics lives there. Um, square pegs, round holes. Are we chopping off limbs when we should be giving antibiotics? Um, <laughs> pretty basic stuff. Um, the idea of patient-centered care um, intersects very nicely with the idea of fitting and the, the idea of, of actually addressing problems. Uh, is it fit for purpose? Is also um, there in medicine. Now, the question of whether it belongs in medical training is really a question of what's the balance between, between those things. They're all there, they're all important. Um, but if we focus on one to the detriment of the other, um, I think that's an issue. But, but it, will, it will sensitize people for instance, to, to some aspects of modern healthcare, uh, like uh, the notion of um, guidelines that are not promoted as, a, as the basis for uh, sort of minimal performance, but often are, are put forward as ideal performance, uh, and in which essentially we do approach people, uh, what, whatever shape they are, with the same uh, round round peg or the same, you know, regardless of the shape of the of the hole we're trying to fit. Um, yeah, yeah. So people will be sensitized to the problems of that sort of approach by. Um, having access to some of the ways uh, that you that you use to approach those same problems of care. Yeah, no, no, exactly. Yeah, and, I and, um, we have another question that has to do with, um, as you think about your approach to, to addressing problems if, in care, um, how do you in, involve uh, in the description of the problem or in the translation of a potential set of solutions, how do you involve the needs of clinicians, the needs of caregivers, um, both informal and professional caregivers uh, face challenges in their work, um, that uh, challenges their sustainability, burnout is it's a common problem, for instance. Um, how does that get into your thinking and in the way you, you shape solutions? Uh, what have you learned from your interactions with clinicians? You, you work embedded in a healthcare system, so it must be not only because you can execute on your ideas and translate care, but also you, because you might be learning from their own practice. What can you say about those things? Yeah, so it's definitely a learning experience. I have no background um, in biology, let alone medicine, um, as I began that work. I think... Um, there's a lot to be learned from the, from the experience of clinicians, the stories they tell, their practices, the relationships that they have with their clinicians. And similarly, there's a lot to learn from, from patients' experience, both in their day-to-day -day lives, the problems they bring to medicine and how they are treated for better or worse from there. I think what I try to do in that space is, is often a lot of, language work which you mentioned earlier which is mm -hmm. is how do we how do we find the right language or, or point of view that's that's um that's helpful so one example of that is work that we did on um uh, kids turning up at the ed with 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 ear infections um and and helping um helping turn the conversation away from whether this kid should have an antibiotic or not as a medical dilemma to uh, whether an antibiotic, antibiotic should be administered or not isn't actually the problem that the 
doctors facing the problem along with their par- the kids parents is that this kid's been screaming all night um, people are exhausted um, and that and that's really what we ought to be focusing on as the object of care not not the infection of the year necessarily or the or, or not the not the infection of the ear um, ex- exclusively um, uh, are you there you- Yes, you know, I was just saying that uh, that the problem is not not uh, just the infection of the ear, but it's also the experience of of suffering and and uh, exhaustion of the parents as they show up to the emergency department. Um, um, so, um, uh, do you feel that an approach of problem solving, a purposeful approach, uh, one of regenerating care, is is one that that offers? Um, a, a, an opportunity for realization or flourishing also for the caregiver, not just for the patient. Yeah, no, I think that's where I was going is that um, a lot of the burnout seems to be around issues of um, trying to put the square guideline peg in the round hole, as you're saying, and, and recognizing that it doesn't actually allow you to care for the person both in the way that you want and in terms of what it is that they really need. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, We're getting another question that has to do with, well, first an appreciation. uh, The the person saying that this conversation with you has reminded them of the uh, beauty and importance of caring for patients uh, um, and uh, uh, finds what you're proposing uh, both amazing and unique, uh, which I, I resonate with. Um, but the question almost seems directed at me, which is how difficult it's been to, to try to bring these ideas and this way of practicing med- medicine into an environment that the person asking the question describes as traditional and uh, predominantly biomedical. You know, in other words, a modeling that is focused on fighting disease versus um, you know, building health. Um, um, and I, I, I'm going to resonate with a little bit of your answer, uh, you know, in the sense that um, I think understanding the, the language uh, opportunities uh, that you uh, offer us to re-express or reinterpret what's going on and to reframe what we're doing uh, is uh, very, very helpful. And uh, for me, it's led to, you know, a, a, a whole approach, you know, in relation to uh, the work that we're doing with the patient revolution and trying to change the context that this uh, person's asking about, a context that might make us feel that we don't have the range of opportunities to um, work with patients and impact their lives, uh, a range that you I are very active at identifying. It's almost like as you are going through you're, you're, you're appreciating the full potential and, and that gap between what is and what could be is, is something that animates you and by giving it language, uh, you transfer that, that, that energy uh, and that creativity um, to the people who are called to care with a more biomedical approach. Uh, am I saying that correctly? Yeah, no, no, I, I think you, you are, I think. Um the the problems of people and the and the language that's productive and actually being able to address that um, sometimes by changing the way we think about or practice care is a large part of what animates me yeah um uh, a, a colleague of yours just resonated uh, as well with me in the sense that it's been uh, very helpful to work with you um, and see the connection between other important concepts uh, in these days, such as the concepts of justice and, and humanity and how those connect with the concept, uh, concept of care. Um, and as we wrap up here, uh, Ian, uh, and we start thinking about uh, what comes up next, uh, I have to ask you, you know, uh, what, what, uh, what really comes next for Ian Hargraves? Uh, lunch. Um, <laughs> uh, so in, in terms in terms of, of, of the work that we're doing, I think the big question that I'm interested in exploring is um, how do we turn the focus from the outcomes that medicine achieves to the recomposition of people's lives that care um, brings forth. So how do we even understand 
appreciate how people live their lives and who they are and how it's composed, how it's coherent, how it's well formed or or um, less well formed, um, and and how will we even know that any contribution of medicine or any reshaping that medicine's involved in has actually contributed to the coherence, um, the aesthetic even, um, of a person's life. Uh, one, one word that seems absent uh, 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 from your language is the, is the notion of power. And people are asking me, what, 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 you know, what, what, how do you consider power and power imbalances in healthcare? Um, it seems to me, as, I, as I'm using the word power and, and emphasizing the P in power, that um, I'm, I'm recreating a little bit of a, of a war zone, of a fighting environment. And here you are trying to create and speaking of, of things that are, that, well, it was a role of power in, 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 the, in the way you see the world and the way you respond to it. I think the way that I pick it up is that um, there's a lot of interest in power and balance um, and the like, and rightfully so, and there's a lot of energy focus or conversation focused in that direction, um, which is great. At the same time, um, the conception or the point of view of power allows us to do some important things and seek important changes in the world, but it has the potential to obscure other, other important things as well. So I think um, the work on purposeful shared decision making, for example, bracketers, brackets for a time the, the discourse of power and says what needs to be done in a person's life and how do we do it together. And sure, solving power imbalances will help that happen, but reconciling those power imbalances by itself doesn't make good care happen. And, and so if you move, um, new possibilities open up. But at the same time, I would say that um, I hope that if the dominant point of view was that um, we just need to solve patients' problems, um, that when we take that to extreme, the issue of power disappears and power imbalances. And so I would hope I would turn my attention and say, hey, there's a problem here and let's look at it from that point of view as well. Hmm. We're getting a question about um, um, a sort of chain of production of evidence where um, you know, new, new, new insights, new evidence is produced, synthesized, they're transferred oftentimes in guidelines. And then, you know, in, in an industrialized approach, those guidelines are then uh, turned into the way we treat patients. Wh wh where do you think in that chain uh, that you're familiar with, wh where do you see the biggest potential for human-centered design? Um, uh, where, where, where should it uh, play a biggest, where can it play its biggest role in realizing uh, person-centered care? So I, I think it involves recognizing what the purpose of evidence is. Um, so in my mind, the purpose of evidence isn't to express biological, um, biomedical truth that this is, this is the likelihood of this happens when we do that. Um, neither is it to tell people what they should be doing. Um, its purpose is actually to be a resource whose potential can be drawn upon um, as part of the response to a particular person's situation. So um, I think the big question of evidence isn't, is it precise or accurate or should be followed, but does it actually speak to the case? Which is, which is more of a legal conception of what evidence is. We use evidence in a, in a justice concept because it speaks to the case, not because it expresses a fundamental truth or, or directs um, what people should be doing. And to, to speak to the case, it has to, um, it, it has to hold up to scrutiny. It has to be of, uh, it has to be it has to be believable and it has to be truthful. And uh, 
but all of those things are subservient to its purpose and its purpose is to advance the case, to advance the situation of the person whose care is our, our primary goal. It yeah. has to matter. It has to matter in the lives of people because you're focused on the way people matter. Yeah, it has to contribute. It has to contribute. Um, uh, Ian, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Um, you expand uh, the way we think about things. You, you give us new language. You focus our mind on, on uh, making a difference in the lives of people by, when we care, making sure that we are doing it for the right reason, that we focus on the way uh, people matter, that we try to matter in people's lives in ways that are productive and, and contribute to the realization. And I'm, I'm absolutely fascinating, fascinated by the, what you're going to do next as you move this notion of uh, design, which uh, up to this point has been very much focused on uh, redesigning the way we care for people to now thinking about uh, taking that further and, uh, and building health with patients, uh, uh, caring by redesigning um, uh, health and health care. It's... Um, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, talking with you and learning from you and sharing you with, uh, with our audience. Uh, thank you again, Ian. Thank you, thank you. It's been great. Excellent. Uh, join us uh, on the next uh, CareCast um, and uh, from the Knowledge and Evaluation Research Unit. Thank you very much for your attention and please take care.